Hello, my name is Ernest Eigner. I'm a PhD candidate at the Department for Socioeconomics, doing my PhD on the economic discipline. Um, I have been working for the Ames Summer School for three years now as a lecturer and teacher, and this is the first time I'm holding an introductory lecture on the economic discipline. The lecture is usually about three hours long, so I, will, I have shortened it drastically, but at the same time will still be a bit beyond the 30 minutes I have been planning for. So the lecture will talk about plural economics, nature and money. What is the motivation and why is it relevant to think about economics when we're thinking about society, economy, nature and money? John Maynard Keynes, a famous economist, has pointed out a practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. So if we're thinking about societal change, a great transformation, a transition to a zero emission society, trying to strive for the Paris goal, the 1.5 degree goal, we need to think about economics, the economy, and how can we transform it. I will first give a short motivation why we should take a different perspective theories and consider variation of definition of economics. Then I will outline the concept of embeddedness, draw attention to social aspects of economies, then talk about capitalism distribution and classes, and then money, and finally I will conclude with some questions for you to ask and reflect upon during the rest of the summer school. Ontology. What is the economy? So let's start directly. Ontology is the question of what is in the sciences. Ontology is often determined to prefer prior to any empirical research. It represents a set of beliefs about the nature of the world. For instance, what is and what is not. Are there workers or other individuals? Are there corporations or are there firms? It influences the question researchers ask, the ways to, in which they practice science and how we teach economics. In sciences, we can agree on a few ontological uh, presuppositions that we, we use to analyze the world we're living in. Critical realism, a philosophy of science, has pointed out a few aspects that should be considered when we conduct social, natural or interdisciplinary sciences. Critical realism distinguishes between the real, the actual and the empirical. The real are generating mechanisms that lead to certain events which we in the end experience. These experiences are this what we observe in, as part of empirical research. In today's society is often expressed as data. We need to look at the respective data to understand what's going on in the world. At the same time, the data as such doesn't tell us anything about the generating mechanisms that on the one hand generated the data, but also generated the social reality that should be represented by the data. This draws our attention uh, to the fact that we need, in science, we need to talk about the respective mechanisms and should not only limit ourselves to data or experiences or empirical investigations. In particular, conditions of regularity can only be observed in times of instability, although they also operate in times of stability. So, for instance, if we're thinking of the corona crisis, we will observe a lot of social structures and limited or unlimited agency of certain actors that would not be observable in times of stability. However, the generating mechanisms that uh, enable and disable these respective actions are also operating in times of stability. So we should not forget about the respective mechanisms during times of stability that have been revealed now. The generating mechanisms in open systems may come from different strata. So for instance, the reason why a price is formed in a particular way is due to dynamics in the biophysical sphere, in the social sphere, or in the economic sphere. These stratas may be hierarchical, as I will point out soon. The mechanisms that lead to a certain event uh, uh, can be combined in different ways. So continual possibility that similar events are brought about through different mixes of generating mechanisms and where there is also the converse possibility that variations in events may occur because of different mixes. So obviously in science we will try to reveal what are the generating mechanisms and how have they been combined and in which way uh, do they lead to a certain event and are they also relevant if we do not observe them in terms of empirical experience at the very moment, but they are revealed during times of instability. This leads us to the relevance of diversity of investigation.
There are many ways to adequately, in, adequately investigate the economy. They all draw attention to different mechanisms. For sure, in sciences, we have to agree which is the dominant, the most important, the right, the empirical experienced, but also maybe not empirical experienced, but still underlying generating mechanisms, and which is the valid and which theory is not valid. Classification, however, is not sufficient for that. Mechanisms also have to be plausible, and different modes of justification can be applied. However, that would be beyond, of this, beyond this lecture. Economics, we thus have a wide variety of theories that investigate different aspects of the economy, focus on different generating, uh, focusing on different generating mechanisms. The dominant school of thought is neoclassical economics. The starting point of analysis is scarcity. It assumes that things are scarce and thus there is allocation problems. Who gets the scarce resource and who not? The price should allocate the goods and services accordingly. However, there might be asymmetric information, so prices are wrong and people have different knowledge about goods and services and markets are inefficient. However, this focus on scarcity is only one aspect how to think about or one aspect and one way to think about the economy. For instance, there could also be at the core of the economy uncertainty and dominance, as pointed out by post keynesian economics, who emphasize that we actually do not know how the future is developing because there is things like fundamental uncertainties. We cannot allocate probabilities of risk to all events. So actors have to use rule of thumbs to make their decisions. And as a consequence, economies are out of equilibrium. So there might be unemployment without actually intentional anybody wanting it to be there. Further, there is dominance. Some actors are more powerful than others and dominate over others. This is, for instance, also emphasized by feminist economists who are focusing, who argue that we are living in a patriarchal society and in patriarchy, men are dominating over women. This is also reflected in the economic process and, for instance, in the division of paid and unpaid labor in our society, or the gender pay gap, or the underpayment of work that is predominantly made, pursued by women. Um, so each theory uh, takes a different stance. It has a different conceptual basis of the subject area of study. The concept is a mental representation of the essential typical properties of something, considered without regard to the particular properties of any specific instance or example. So the core concept, for instance, of neoclassical economics is scarcity, and they would argue that this is essential and a typical property of any economy. Post-Keynesians would argue that for the case of uncertainty, feminist economists for the case of dominance and evolutionary economists for the case of change. Obviously, a lot of theories combine, combine several of these concepts for the analysis of the economy. So plenty of generative mechanisms leading potentially to the same event. Different theories are helping us to better understand them. Economics, however, is as practiced in science and taught at universities, not reflecting this wide variety of generative mechanisms as represented by different theories. There has been a wide critique of the economic discipline. There are shortcomings of economic research, for instance, lack of interdisciplinarity, methodological and theoretical uh, pluralism is also lacking, monoparadigmatic orientation to the focus on neoclassical economics, and the empirical turn has been criticized for focusing too much on data and too little on generating mechanisms that lead to the respective observed events. Um, contested implications for economies are also following from this particular focus. For instance, the failure to predict the financial crisis, ideological biases, the impact on economic students in terms of hedonism and degrees of self-direction and the globalization of the economic discipline. There is a few institutions, so-called elite licensing institutions, that define what economics is about and what it is not about. These institutions are located in the Anglo-American area and thus have a huge impact on the global political economy because they define how we think and what is supposed to be an economy and what not. At the same time, uh, the economic discipline is marginal. Uh, heterodox economic branches are marginalized within the economic discipline. This can be illustrated with a wide variety of uh, empirical observations, but also by a wide variety of generating mechanisms that explain why this respective uh, marginalization is taking place. So, for instance, if you are thinking of uh, so there has been one study published in the American Journal of Economic 
and the American Economic Review, one of the most important economics journals. Um, they are investigating how different fields uh, are represented in the economic discipline. They are defining fields, for instance, as microeconomics, metrics, so econometrics, microeconomics, finance, and then they're having a category which is called miscellus. This is the category which has been growing most, as you see quite in the middle of the figure, the dotted line. If you look in the footnotes of the respective publication, you will find out that this is composed of a wide variety of heterodox approaches. So those uh, all other schools of thought except behavioral and neoclassical economics that you have seen above. This reveals again on a discursive level of marginalization, which is also represented in the institutional sphere, uh, but also in terms of the research re remuneration. So economics is fairly focused on neoclassical economics. In the periphery, there is also heterodox research that tries to reveal a wider variety uh, of generating mechanisms for the economic reality we are observing. So what could be constitutive for the economic reality we're observing? What is constitutive depends on the definition to economics. So definitions are key because they define the, the core concepts we're investigating and the strata of reality we consider relevant for generating the economy we're observing. So um, there is, I, I divided them into three there is many more definitions, but for illustrative cases, I give you now five definitions divided into three different uh, spheres. So Leonel Robbins and Mankiw Taylor focus on scarcity. For instance, economics is the study of how society manages its scarce resources. Julie Nelson and Tony Lawson at the same time emphasize the so social embeddedness of the economy. For instance, Tony Lawson, the economy is an aspect of social reality. It exhibits emergent and is characteristically a dynamic open system of a historical process form in which change is cumulative through social interaction. And finally, Clive Spesch emphasizes the biophysical foundation of the economy, saying the real economic systems move goods and services through a process of extraction, transportation, transformation, and on to final use by a range of social actors before returning all energy and materials to the environment. So as you see, there is different definitions of what we consider the subject or object of study of economists or what we would perceive as the economy when we talk about the economy. So I will move now from the green to the yellow and then later to the blue. So first focusing on the biophysical sphere, then uh, introducing some concepts of the social reality and then finally focusing more on the economic system as such. Embeddedness of economies in. So from this, uh, one can follow that. Um, so one could argue and one can define and follow from Clive Spech definition of economics that uh, economies are embedded within, uh, within societies, which are again embedded within a biophysical reality. There is also a hierarchy between the different spheres. There wouldn't be any society without biophysical processes, and there wouldn't be an economy without a society. Um, this is suggests an open system conceptualization. So if we are talking about economic processes, we should take into consideration generative mechanisms on the level of matter and energy, but also outside of the paid sphere, for instance, unpaid work, or also social exchange. Energy originally came from the sun, however, has been accumulated on several levels on the, on the planet Earth, and also gravity contributes to the available energy. However, all economic processes or any economic process is a process of material transformation, which is driven by human work and non-human work. So if we're thinking of the economy, it is not very helpful if we think of it as a closed system that is only focusing on the uh, on, on supply and demand uh, allocated using prices and quantities, because this suggests there is only one generating mechanism which is relevant for the economic development at large. At the same time, we could argue there is many more, for in, some of them operating also in the biophysical or in the societal sphere. So how comes or is actually our economy um, a process of material transformation? What is the role of energy in it? One illustrative would be looking at the most important corporations globally. How do we measure importance? One way to think about it is revenue-based. So which corporations globally make the largest revenue 
in made the largest revenue in 2019. Uh, eight out of the 10 most important or largest corporations globally are, uh, in, are in the oil and gas industry. The other four are retail, electricity and automotive industry. This reveals that oil is still at the center of our global economy. Malm is referring to that phenomena as fossil capitalism. So the current economy is a process of material transformation driven by human and non-human slash oil work. So oil is foundational for current economic processes. Um, and this is probably one of the challenges of our time. So from the biophysical foundation of our economy, we could move on to social aspects of the economies. As pointed out, economies are, can be conceptualized as embedded in societies. What is then the economy? The economy can be understood as a social provisioning system, a social system where people organize themselves collectively to get the living. This has been pointed out by Power 2006. And this would include, for instance, aspects of unpaid and caring labor, but also ethical jud judgments or human and environmental well-being. So understanding of the economy is a lot more than just monetary processes. There is a wide variety of coordinating mechanisms operating within social provisioning systems. For instance, markets, for sure, so which is a coordination over prices and is the focus of neoclassical economies. At the same time, there is also redistribution, where goods and services are coordinated, allocated and redistributed via central organization. And reciprocity, which is coordination via interaction, an immediate interaction beyond money as a media. So people agree, judge, talk, and decide upon things without using money to uh, coordinate their information processes. The distinction between the three coordination mechanisms goes back to Polanyi 1944, an anthropologist who argues that we are living in mixed economies where usually different coordination mechanisms operate next to each other. In addition, uh, to coordination mechanisms, also structure and agency and power are of importance in the show, social realm of the economy. Structure and agency are two concepts. The one referring to, to structure that enable and disable certain actors. It usually referred to, if you're saying this sentence, it's not me, it's the system. For instance, it's the structure, it's, it's the law why I have to do that. Or it's me, actually, who wants to do that, but it's actually the law which forces me to do it. Law is one structure, but also the economic system is a structure. It's not me who wants to buy the chair. It's the economic system or it's an advertisement who tells me to buy the certain thing. Structures are defining what is normal. At the same time, agency is uh, giving uh, actors power. Who is powerful and who is responsible? An actor is agency if he has the power to get B to do what B would not do otherwise. So it's the capacity to bring effects. If we're thinking about the economy and the social reality we live in, we'll observe structures on multiple levels. For instance, uh, the, the roads. So there is also physical structures, how cities are organized, which are leading to a certain type of transport. If there is no pedestrian, you do not have agency to decide actually that you are walking and you will need to take the car because otherwise your life is threatened. So in that context, Marx already said, men make their own history, referring to agency, but they do not make it just as they please, referring to structure. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly encountered, given and transmitted from the past. So there is a structure, but at the same time we are having agency. Have that into consideration when you think about social change and how you can achieve social change and where you best enter and which leverage points you're using to achieve social change. At the same time, be also aware about power. There's different ways we can think about power in our society. One distinction is by boys who distinguishes five types of power. I will introduce you three. Purchasing power is the most, uh, the most discussed one in our societies with regard to environmental consumption, saying, okay, if we are willing to pay more for uh, other modes of transports, these modes of transports will start to dominate. At the same time, if there is none of this other mode of transport, we actually do not have any purchasing power because somebody else's decision power or again the power which is deciding that there is no other mode of transport or that other mo modes of transport are considered to be of weaker quality. For instance, a train is worse than a plane or we do not provide uh, 
train corridors, but car corridors, as is taking place in European Union investment policies. So power plays an essential role on the structure of the social reality and the economy we are operating in. And different actors have a varying agency. For instance, a global corporation cannot really com be compared with a local firm in terms of the agency over the economic process. So uh, have that in mind if you're thinking about economic challenges. Who has power? How can you gain power? And how can power be limited of those who have more power than they are supposed to have to achieve social change? In addition to structure, agency, and power, we should also think about institutions and values. What are institutions? Institutions clearly go beyond individuals. Institutions, not to be equalized with or confused with organizations, are systems of established and embedded social rules that structure social interaction. For instance, language is an institution. Another more, less abstract set of institutions are rules. Rules are leading us to do in circumstances X, Y. There is two types of rules we can distinguish. The one is norms and the other one is social conventions. Norms are imminently normative and evaluative. They are saying, okay, this is wrong to do, this is right to do. They are forms of code of conduct. You are supposed to, to call your professor in Austria professor. Otherwise, you are, uh, you are breaking a norm. There is no legal rule for that, although there is also other legal rules. For instance, you're not supposed to enter the office of the professor without asking him or her because this is against law, because it's his office. There is also social conventions, for instance, that you will greet the professor or will greet anybody else. These are usually self-reinforcing and they do not reflect any normative or evaluative character. At the same time, they also help to coordinate social reality and thus also the economy. Um, one example uh, of a global norm is the anti-fossil fuel. The anti-fossil fuel norm is an emergent uh, norm that has uh, appeared in the last few years, as argued by Blondel, uh, Colgan and, and Green. The anti-fossil fuel norm is a promise of a global no moral norm prohibiting fossil fuel related activities. It originates from a concerted attempt to change what counts as appropriate, ethical and just behavior. So it's, uh, as you see on the map in the background, there is many places where organizations that promote an anti-fossil fuel norms are active and trying to make clear to the world that fossil fuels are not supposed to be used if we are aiming on achieving climate change. This is maybe best compared, for instance, to an anti-slavery norm. For all of us, it is intuitive and the only right thing to not hold slaves. However, 150 years ago, this has not been so obvious. A global norm had to be established that clarifies holding slaves is wrong. This does not mean that there is no slaves at them globally anymore, and those in Austria still have slavery, but still it is absolutely not considered to be right, and everybody will judge anybody heavily if he or she uses, has or owns slaves, so owns other people. Maybe the anti-fossil fuel norm would achieve similar, um, similar, uh, judgments of the use of fossil fuel on a global scale and thus contribute to, uh, to achieving a 1.5 degree goal as agreed on in Paris. In addition to norms, inter we also have to take into consideration... Um, so in addition to norms, we, can also, we should also need to consider values and respective incommensurabilities, as mentioned in the last slide. Um, what is incommensurability? Incommensurability says that humans are not always willing to compare different sets of values on a scale. So, for instance, humans are not willing to account for the life of a slave in 10 euros compared to the life of a tree in 20 euros and say that the tree has a double of a value of a slave. This is also not the case in the other way around. So, for instance, people are not willing to account for the life of a slave, uh, for instance, 10,000 euros, and compare it to the value of a degree, which maybe is assigned 10 euros, because there is something like a value judgment, and people sometimes tend to say, okay, I'm not willing to compare certain things on a monetary scale. For instance, you cannot say that express the value of a human in terms of money as little as you can express the 
the value of a tree in terms of money because it has different values. There is a value inherent or intrinsic to the existence of a human being as such as maybe also to a tree and possibly also to other things. Incommensurability argues that we cannot compare everything or any kind of values on, non on, monetary, on monetary scales and so we cannot calculate trade-offs. We cannot say, okay, this is 10 euros compared to this is 15 euros, so we need to take more of this which is 15 euros, but we face conflicts. We have to decide this or that. For that we need other than market institutions, because market institutions usually operate in the scale of trade-offs comparing different values on, a, on scales. However, there is different institutions in our societies, for instance, judges often compare different values and suggest, okay, this has broken this respective law, and so as a consequence we have to take this action, and the other one is not possible. There is a conflict, a decision has to be made. So incommensurability is important for the economic development. You can look up the slides and look at the details. Unfortunately, you cannot go back in the recording to the respective slide. So now moving on from the, uh, from the social sphere to the economic sphere. The economic system that we're living in is called capitalism. Why is it called capitalism? Capitalism and capitalism are societies uh, tremendously infected, affected by market. Market relations are disembedded from the other social relations, in other words. So pre-capitalist societies, for instance, production and consumption were embedded within other social relations. For instance, production was organized within a family, religious pra practices decided to what extent certain goods and services have been consumed, or political relations decided on the distribution of goods and services. In such pre-capitalist societies, the economic organization was not geared towards wealth accumulation, but maybe in the interest of certain power, powerful actors, or other value sets. Production was distributed through other ways than markets. At the same time, markets potentially existed. So for instance, if we're thinking of small markets where you buy some bread, this may well still exist, but this market has not been dominant in society. It has been embedded within social relations. They were societies with markets, not market societies. Capitalist societies, however, are market societies where other dimensions of life are subjected to market relations. In this context, later introduced concepts like financialization and commodification will be important and reveal the ways how, how markets are expanding to all kinds of spheres and, in the, and this is happening due to the disembeddedness of them from social relation. It's usually can be, in capitalism, you can distinguish between different classes. A lot of different economic theories are using these classes to make arguments for certain uh, uh, policies. And at the same time, distribution plays an important role here. But keep in mind, theories often have political economic implications that also motivated them in the beginning. I will give you some illustrative examples here on this slide. So first of all, there is three different that one can distinguish between three different approaches to distribution in the economic discipline. Neoclassical economics in general says capital and labor are paid according to the factor productivities. So the more productive a worker is, the more the higher his or her income is. The more productive machinery is, the more or higher is the income of the capitalist. This is an outcome out of efficient markets and those is supposed to be neutral. Also within the labor markets, those who are productive are receiving a higher income and those who are less productive are receiving a lower income in, in an ideal market assumption. At the same time, we are observing gender pay gaps and so on and so on. So distribution appears to be not only determined by economic and market processes, but much more accumulative historical processes and dominant, dominating relationships between different economic actors. Keynesian economists are aware of that, and moreover, they argue that distribution affects employment, capital accumulation, and growth. So, if we are thinking about the distribution of income in a society, Keynesian economists would say that if there is a skewed income distribution, this will lead to a lack of demand since higher income groups tend to save more and do not invest their income and as a consequence you have a lack of economic growth. This can lead to instable capital accumulation processes and those fiscal and monetary and redistributive policy, uh, policy interventions are demanded. 
This, these not necessarily only should be rule-based. So for instance, this unemployment insurance, which kicks automatically in if there is a recession as at the moment, but also discretionary. For instance, as we observe now that the European Union agrees on a high level funding project for infrastructural projects pursued by politicians. So discretionary policies is part of an economic a policy set suggested by Keynesian economists due to their awareness of the instability of capital accumulation processes, including effects of inequality and, and, uh, and distribution. Political economy goes one step further and argues that distributional conflicts are really at the core of economic development. Since different classes pursue different interests, for instance, workers pursue higher wages, profits, uh, capitalists in, in try to increase their profits, and landowners try to increase their rents. And then from this starting point, you can think of economists and allocate them to the respective classes. For instance, David Ricardo represented the capitalists in the great, in the in the parliament in Great Britain, Malthus represented the landowners and Karl Marx represented the workers. Each of them suggesting different theories uh, that on the one hand uh, argued for a redistribution for to their respective class and at the same time also uh, led to capital accumulation processes. Um, so there is a complementary argument here that was a redistribution, a redistributive aspect in their own interest and in capital accumulation uh, argument in the interest of all. From a degrowth perspective today, each of the arguments would be problematic because we would say capital accumulation is heavily correlated with the use of oil. So we need to reflect on how we actually organize our economy outside of capital accumulation processes. However, this is a different story. Quite insightful with, with regard to the class struggles concerning capitalists and landowners and capital and labor, other stories of the Corn Law, you can read that up, or the definition of exploitation by Karl Marx. Um, however, capitalism as such is not only a question of costs, but also about the distribution of costs. In mainstream economic theory, we would also often talk about externalities, effects that arise when property rights and legal contracts do not cover some of the effects of the decision maker's action. This is analyzed in the closed system framework, as you see at the right bottom. And this closed first system framework says, okay, anything that is not included in the price is external. However, if we are thinking of an open system as suggested before and consider the earth as such, we will observe there is nothing or external. Everything is part of the system and the direct and indirect losses are sustained by a third person. Cost shifting takes place to the future generation, to the poor or to other species. So as such, we could consider capitalism as a cost-shifting economic institution. It is an economy of unpaid costs, Cup said in 1972. A substantial portion of actual cost of production remains unaccounted. They are shifted to third persons or borne by the community as a whole of values. If we are thinking about economic development, thus embedded in so social reality and in biophysical reality, we should ask ourselves, who is, who, is bearing, who is carrying the costs? Open systems do not allow for external, but ask where costs have been shifted. Um, so now on to money. As said before, uh, capitalist societies are market societies. At the core of markets is money. Money is the institution which sets prices that's the most obvious way we are observing money. However, historically, and also today still, money is used as an obligation settlement institution. What does this mean? In other words, money is first and foremost a mean to settle debts. Debts can be considered as quantified obligations. An obligation is, you have to do this or that. A debt is, you have to give me 10 or 12. So debts are quantified obligations. If, I'm, uh, if a bank gives a credit to somebody, then money is created, as I will introduce in a second. So we cannot really understand money without talking about debt. At the same time, there is also other aspects of money that are also more discussed in the mainstream. Money is considered to be a mean of exchange, a unit of account, and a wealth storage. Further, in the Austrian school, money is considered a media of information, so it tells people the value of things, 
and if money processes are distorted, allocations are not happening in the right way. When we're thinking about the means of exchange of money, is that we are using money to allocate goods and services in our society. A unit of account refers to the fact that we have measured the value of things in terms of money to make them comparable. However, this stands in stark contradiction to incommensurable values, which suggests that we need more than one metric to actually measure the <laughs> values in the world. Further, money is used as a wealth storage. We store money in order of using it later, and money gives us the opportunity to, in a later stage, buy things and goods and services which we can do not buy yet, so it's a form of a wealth, wealth storage. Finally, most of the time when we talk about money, we think of general purpose money. So money that can be used for any legal purpose in our society. We use the money for buying houses, we use the money for buying cars, we use the money for buying oil wells, we use the money for buying plastic-based computers. So we use the money for all kinds of things. At the same time, we also use it maybe to buy organic carrots and also to buy uh, t-shirts or shirts. So money is in this form a general purpose money. In our societies we would talk about the euro. However, there is also special purpose money. So money which is only used for a specific role or specific goods and services. This has been very prevalent in ancient societies or also in middle age societies where there maybe have existed 17 or 18 different kinds of monies with special purposes. One money which has only been allowed to buy buy, for instance, uh, 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 food, another money which has only been used for the carpenter. And then, for instance, in Brazil, there has been a scheme where a certain type of water system, which can be compared to money, has been introduced to organize public transport and waste disposal. So this is a special purpose money, which maybe exist in complement to the general purpose money um, and not seek to replace it. In our societies currently, however, we mainly or to a dominant extent have a general purpose money. This is the euro. How is the euro created or how does it come into circulation? So what is happening most of the time is something like that. Engelbert and Edeldrag go to a bank and borrow money. The bank checks that they can pay back a loan. The bank grants them a loan. The bank writes plus 1000 in their assets and minus 1000 in the liability. Money is created. Monetary creation occurs ex nihilo. So this is when money comes into circulation. A central bank or other institutions are not of relevant. This is only happening on the level of the commercial bank. Only then the commercial bank is going to the central bank or to the interbank market, so to other, central, to other commercial banks, and borrows the corresponding reserves and keep them in its account at the central bank. So reserves are thus a ratio However, they are not linked to the money creation. Money is created ex nihilo when a, uh, when a, credit, when a loan uh, is granted to, for instance, Engelbert and Edeltraut. The supply of money is thus endogenously de determined by the demand for money. So if firms or households are demanding a lot of money and trying to get a lot of loans, a lot of money is created in the economy. However, if there is bad sentiments, so a negative prospects for economic development, as it is at the moment, this is not the case, and so less money is created. Money creation is endogenous. Important institutions and concepts in the context of money. So first, obviously, the commercial banks. As said, they engage in banking activities, for instance, granting loans with private or public organizations and have the right to create money. They give loans against conditions, they take deposits against conditions, both obviously based on legal frameworks, but also their own judgment. The deposits do not need to equal loans. Effectively, they create money that circulates until credits are repaid. Reserves are a quotient of the loans held in central banks, but they are not immediately linked to each other. Just a quotient is not allowed to, or to go beyond a certain level. At the same time, central banks engage in banking operations with commercial banks and target selected economic goals. For instance, the ECB targets the 2% inflation goal officially. That's the legal mandate. What is inflation? Inflation is the average change in prices of a specific goods basket and depends on a region, asset class and consumer group. In general, we can calculate inflation in many different ways. For instance, low-income households have a different consumer behavior, so they face different inflations. High-income households 
again face different inflation, particularly asset inflation. For instance, uh, house ownership is affecting their the inflation they are facing in the daily transactions. So the, Euro the European Central Bank, however, takes a specific, well-defined, specific good basket to calculate the inflation. And any policy they are doing is obviously having redistributive effects, because depending on how you define the goods basket, you will target a different set of inflation. And as a consequence, you have different distributive effects in an economy. The instruments they're using for that are, for instance, they're setting the interest rate a bank, a commercial bank gets if they try to get money from the central bank or unconventional policies. For instance, they are buying assets to get money in the circulation of the economy. At the same time, many central banks, as you will also hear during the rest of the summer calls, have other calls. For instance, uh, the US Fed operates as a lender of last resorts and has other targets, for instance, unemployment. Currently, central banks also ensure stability and ensure liquidity, which entails uh, and, and other activities just as targeting inflation. Decisions on which assets should be bought are also possible. At the moment, risk premium are used at the same and how to calculate the risk is not a neutral pro process. Similar purpose-driven regulations is possible if you're regulating financial markets. It could particularly regulate brown industries compared to green industries. At the same time, since central banks are moving quite beyond their their mandate at the moment, for instance, the ECP, the question is, what is the democratic legitimacy of a central bank? And how can we limit the power of such an important institution that decides on distribution of matters in the European economy? So, in addition to these two actors, I would like to introduce you now, towards the end of this lecture, to financialization and commodification. What are these two concepts and how do they relate to money? Financialization is the idea of organizing social uh, institutions, for instance, the uh, uh, retirement system or the regulation of carbon emissions via financial markets. In the retirement system, we could consider of ensuring our retirement system on a capital base. So we put, we save, we save money, put it in the bank, and the bank is making sure that in 30 or 40 years we will get the money back to the respective values, and the uh, the retirement uh, savings are traded on financial markets. At the same time, we can also consider a pay-go retirement system, which is uh, quite important in Austria. There, the, the current working population is paying the retirement of the current retirement population. Such an institution is organized fairly independent of financial markets and, as a consequence, is more resilient with regard to economic, uh, to financial market developments. Also, with regard to carbon trading, we could think about uh, uh, trading schemes as implemented on the European Union level, uh, which enables the trade of ca carbon uh, emission rights on financial markets, or instead we simply regulate the emissions with, uh, with laws and norms. And as a consequence, the regulation is more independent of financial markets. What we in the last 10 to 20 years observe is an increasing financialization. So more and more activities social institutions and policy goals are organized via financial markets with potentially uh, negative impacts due to the instabilities of the respective markets that have been shown uh, over the course of the last 10 years on a continuous basis. Commodification at the same time is one step before financialization. It's the attempt to making goods and services available to be traded on markets so that you indeed can trade carbon on the markets you need you need to make you need you need to frame it in a way so that it is a good and a service and can be traded. Similarly, if we're thinking of uh, of slaves, we could talk about the commodification of humans so that they can be traded and are treated in an inhuman way. Commodification and decommodification is something that also occurs all over the world constantly and is part of a dynamic process of capitalism, how it's engaging in social relations and how it's expanding or reducing market relations in accumulation processes. So, I would like to conclude now with some questions. Um, these questions are obviously related um, to the concepts that have been introduced to you, and I would like to invite you to use the questions and the concept over the course of the rest of the summer school and critically reflect on what have the lectures, what are the lectures teaching you, and uh, 
and what do they leave out and what do they include? So what actors have power over structures and which not? Who is agency? What material and social foundations of economic interactions are considered? What is the role of oil? Do they focus on individuals or consider groups, institutions, classes, systems or value incommensurability? Who has power, who doesn't? What about corporations? When they refer to values, are they commensurable or incommensurable? How do they understand money? Which aspects do they consider? Who creates money and how is it distributed? Is the economy changing over time or moving back to equilibrium? What is change? Who has power to change? And for which purpose? I hope this lecture is helpful for you for the rest of the summer group. Thank you for your attention.